morning, folks. Welcome to uh, the George Washington University, the Marvin Center. Uh, my name is Michael Foyer. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. And uh, later today, I will be inducted as the president of the National Academy of Education, uh, which I'm very um, honored to tell you. Somebody pointed out to me yesterday that there's only one small uh, vowel difference between being inducted and being indicted. <laughs> uh, I, I'll leave that for my friends to sort out for me at some point. Anyway, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Um, so just, just by way of context and setting, uh, the George Washington University was founded in 1821. Uh, we're heading toward our 200th uh, birthday party to, uh, in about seven years or so. Uh, the National Academy of Education, on the other hand, was founded in 1965, which means that somehow this university was able to thrive for that many years even without the Academy of Education. Um, the Academy of Education is an honorific body. It is an independent, private, nonprofit organization that is committed to the basic principle that, um, first of all, education is probably the most important investment that a society can make. And second, and because of that, research and inquiry and scholarship about education deserves the highest standards of, uh, of academic inquiry that we can muster. And that's what the Academy strives to do, and it's a truly a great uh, pleasure and honor to work with my colleagues in the Academy. Um, and in addition to the wonderful fellowship programs that the Academy uh, runs, thanks to uh, the great, wonderful support of the Spencer Foundation, uh, we also try to convene committees and do studies and provide a bridge between the world of research and the world of policy and practice. So this morning, uh, we're going to be releasing a, a new report that is the result of um, a, about a year and a half worth, at least, of deliberations and a quite intensive study. Um, and I guess, by way of introduction to the report, um, I think most everybody in this room knows that the world of education is um, in quite a state these days. We're under a lot of pressure with respect to the quality of education, its effects on uh, the economy, the effects of the economy on education, the role of teachers and teaching, uh, and the role of assessment and evaluation in this uh, great, uh, big, complex uh, ecology. Uh, this study originated uh, because the Academy came to the realization that the evaluation of teacher preparation, including that which takes place in institutions of higher education, but not only, um, was under increasing scrutiny and was being held to increasing uh, standards of accountability for all kinds of reasons, and that um, if there is a sort of abiding irony, perhaps, in all of this, it is that the criticism of teacher preparation um, tends to sometimes get a little bit ahead of the data one would hope for to actually uh, legitimate that kind of criticism. So part of this report and part of what we did was an attempt to clarify, first of all, what's happening in the world of the evaluation of teacher preparation, um, and second, to try to develop some principles and some ideas for how the evaluation of programs could be improved. Um, and you know, you could pick up just about any major newspaper almost every week and read some kind of critique of education writ large 
schools of education as one of the culprits in our current situation and so forth. And uh, what we hope with this report is that we will um, initiate in some sense, but actually promote an ongoing dialogue among people in the various communities that care enough about this um, to try to make it better. And uh, so you'll hear from some of the folks uh, who have been involved in the report, as well as some distinguished um, guests who have now had a chance to read it and will be here to comment. And then we're going to leave time for uh, questions and comments and discussion uh, <coughs> with you. I want to say a special welcome uh, to um, our dissertation and postdoctoral fellows who are here. Um, that's actually one of the things that the Academy does that I'm most proud of and most happy about is that we are working so hard to make sure that the next generation of scholars working on this um, is strong and enriched with itself and with its community. And um, in so doing, I just want to say to all our fellows, you certainly do uh, enrich us. And I know that we've had a terrific time this just uh, again uh, yesterday and today. And the uh, folks in the academy who run these fellowships, in particular Marilyn Cochran Smith, wherever you are, Marilyn, there's Marilyn, deserve a great big round of applause for the wonderful work. <laughs> There are several um, members of the board of directors of the National Academy of Education. I'm not going to do a whole go around here because that'll pretty much wrap up the morning. Uh, but I want to thank them uh, for being here and for their leadership. And then, of course, we've got our Academy members who are here, and in particular, a small group of our newest elected members. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have all of you with us. Uh, with respect to the report itself, a couple of special acknowledgments. Uh, first of all, we had a steering committee that uh, got together uh, and figured out what and how we were going to do this. Uh, I had the pleasure of chairing that committee, uh, and it was a pleasure because of who the members of the committee were. Uh, Bob Floden, from whom you will hear a lot uh, shortly, uh, Brian Rowan, and Deborah Ball, both from the University of Michigan. Jean Burns, the Associate Commissioner uh, for Teaching and Leadership at the Louisiana Board of Regents, uh, and a colleague of mine uh, here at uh, GW, Lionel Howard, a uh, professor in our uh, Department of uh, Educational Leadership. So thank you to the steering committee. Uh, we had uh, the great good fortune of being able to uh, have um, Naomi Chodowski as one of our co-authors on this report, and thank you, Naomi, for a spectacular job. And uh, in the sort of final lapse of putting this together, uh, Nancy Kober, who is here also, was our editor, and we are extremely grateful for the wonderful work that you guys did. Uh, Judy Ahn, who was the uh, principal staff officer of the Academy of Education, who managed all of this for us, really deserves a big round of applause from everybody for keeping me uh, sane and keeping the project on track. Thank you very much, Judy. And with that, the other members of the Academy staff, uh, Greg White in particular, who's the executive director, uh, but the whole group, Phil and Jack and all of you, thank you so much for what you've done here. Um, I think I uh, want to just say one other way of introduction, and that is that there we commissioned a couple of papers in the course of this project, and uh, two authors of one of those papers are here today. Uh, Jean Johnson, who's the dean of the School of Nursing here at GW, and her colleague, Christine. Pins did a marvelous report for us on the state of evaluation of nursing education programs. Um, and that was indeed one of the things that we wanted to do in this study was to see what we could learn from how other professions have taken this uh, assignment to evaluate themselves. Um, 
And um, so the, the paper that we got uh, on nursing is really quite fascinating, and there's a, a chunk of that which is uh, borrowed, cut, pasted, and um, included in the report for which we are very grateful. Um, we commissioned a few other papers too, but I don't think those authors are with us today, one having to do with, um, well, two, two other papers having to do with how this is handled in other countries. Uh, at one point we thought we'd make a, we'd, we'd have more time to actually delve into what the lessons are from program evaluation of teacher education in other countries. Uh, we learned a lot from those papers and we've included uh, some of that uh, knowledge uh, in this report and we hope that this becomes again one of the one of the issues that we will foresee being involved in in the future for more research and more comparative analysis and finally um, and maybe this should have been the first acknowledgement that none of this would be possible without the very generous grant that we received from the National Science Foundation um, and here I just want to say that the National Science Foundation had at least two main two main reasons for being interested in this one because they are as most of you know committed to the improvement of in general methods and the uses of methods of evaluation as they relate to education and so for the NSF this kind of a conversation and a serious sort of introspection about how this is done in the world of teacher education and teacher preparation um, ignited some special interest and second of course that the National Science Foundation has uh, for obvious reasons a particular concern with the state of STEM education now and in the future and how the evaluation of teacher preparation relates specifically to the preparation of STEM educators was the other reason. And I just want to say a, a major big thank you to Janice Earle, who is here from the National Science Foundation and to the Foundation for its wonderful support. And we hope that it's the beginning of the continuation of more support. <laughs> well, I can't help but say that. But yeah, if things go well, you never know. OK, so uh, with that, I uh, want to just say what, what the plan is for this panel discussion. Uh, my principal co-author uh, in this report, Bob Floden, who was a member of the steering committee, uh, will lead off with an overview of some of the key findings and some of the key issues that we, that we uh, addressed in the report. He's going to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we're going to have a commentary from our three other distinguished panelists, Gene Burns, who was a member of the committee, and uh, lucky for us, brought the perspective of a uh, state policy person involved in the development of innovative approaches to the evaluation of teacher preparation. So you'll get that perspective uh, from Gene. Uh, Ed Crow, uh, currently an independent consultant and quite an expert in his own right on all of these issues, uh, having spent some time in the Department of Education where he actually was running the program that was developing uh, the sort of federal approach to uh, how this is done, uh, has agreed to uh, give us his perspectives and in anticipation of what I know will be very interesting comments, I thank him in advance. And then finally, uh, my dear colleague uh, Mary Futrell, the former dean of the Graduate School of Education here and also the former president of the National Education Association, whose own uh, track record and contributions to the theory and practice of teaching and the lives of teachers is uh, right up there um, in the Olympic gold category. So we're very grateful that Mary uh, could be with us this morning. And then we're going to have time for uh, conversation and crosstalk, especially if I stop talking now. <laughs> Bob Floden. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so here's what the report looks like. We had some printed copies uh, out, out in front there. Um, uh, it also will be or probably is available on the National Academy of Education website. Um, Michael mentioned the members of the steering committee. Um, so l let me say what we, a little bit about what we were trying to do. And this is a building on what Michael was saying. 
Uh, we're hoping to foster thoughtful discussion about approaches to the evaluation of teacher preparation programs. Um, a lot of what you uh, hear and see in the press and so on is focused on what do we know about teacher preparation programs and makes claims about programs individually or in, in general. But, but uh, what has not been a big part of that discussion is a thoughtful discussion of how should we be doing the work that leads to the evaluation of teacher preparation programs. Um, in, the, in the report, so that, that's the, what we hope to do, and in doing this, we want to enter the discussion by describing some of the ways in which there's variability in the current systems of teacher preparation program evaluation. I'll just use the TPP uh, uh, throughout here. Um, People can think of this as though there were a thing called evaluation of teacher preparation programs, which was a unit, is a unitary thing, but in fact there are uh, multiple purposes for doing evaluation of teacher preparation programs, and what purpose you have in mind makes a difference for what would be desirable in a system for evaluating programs. There are in play, and will continue to be in play, a number of different systems for evaluating teacher preparation programs, and that's just a part of the way we, we do things in America. In America, uh, education is quite a differentiated, some would say fragmented, but I'll just say differentiated enterprise with different players having different responsibilities, and so there will be different systems. And there are a wide range of different sources of evidence that one could use in evaluating programs. Uh, in the report, we describe some examples from other fields and nations. Mike, Michael mentioned a little bit about that. And then we end the report by offering guidance for uh, those who might be engaged in teacher <coughs> preparation program evaluation system design or revision of those systems. So, so we end by saying, here are some things to think about. Here's some guidance about what you should be doing to do thoughtfully um, putting together a system or making improvements in a current system. So uh, the variety of purposes for evaluating teacher preparation programs. Um, we in the report uh, lay out three uh, distinct purposes. Uh, some evaluations will have more than one of these purposes in mind, but they are uh, distinct and uh, what purpose you have in particular in mind will affect the sort of decisions that, that you should make about how to put together a system. So one thing that people have in mind is holding programs accountable. Uh, people in the federal government or the state legislatures often have this in mind. They want to make sure that the people running programs are doing what they're supposed to be doing, producing the things that they're supposed to be producing, and want to hold them accountable to something. That's one purpose. Um, a second purpose is to provide information to what we call consumers. And there are at least a couple of different kinds of consumers. One are the, are the people, students, prospective students, who might be going to teacher preparation programs who would like to know something about the quality of the programs that they might enter because they may be choosing where they're going to go on some basis other than whether the football team is winning. Laughter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and and this, is a, this is a different purpose. They don't care so much about whether the programs are doing what the politician, what the policymakers wanted them to do. They want to know something about, well, what am I going to learn when I go through this program? Uh, are the faculty going to be giving me good instruction? Am I likely to get a job when I come out of this program? Uh, potential future, future employers also may want to have information that could come from an evaluation system. They want to know something about, well, what can I assume that the people coming from this program have studied? What guesses can I make about what they're going to be able to do? And third, uh, another reason for doing uh, teacher pro uh, preparation program evaluation is to support program self-improvement. The programs themselves, individually or collectively, uh, are often interested in doing a better job. And the things that, they, that you might design a system to do that would help them would likely be different than they would for these other purposes. Just to take one example, uh, to make do self program self-improvement, you need to know things that are quite specific about particular things that you're doing in the program. 
the quality of a particular course or whether, how much the students know about something in particular. Whereas for accountability purposes, the measures are often quite crude and won't be very informative for self-improvement. Uh, currently, we have several different systems for doing evaluation of these programs. Uh, there are federal reporting requirements uh, under Title II of the Higher Education Act. Uh, there are national non-governmental bodies, this is the accrediting agency, currently CAPE. Uh, we have state program approval, the, the Constitution delegates authority for education to the states, so every state goes through processes for doing program approval. Uh, you have media and other independent organizations, currently the one that's probably most familiar is the U.S. News uh, publication that linked to the the National Council on Teacher Quality a stu Study of Teacher Preparation. And then you have the teacher preparation programs themselves, individually in networks. So one of the things that we're trying to make clear in this report is there, there's a lot of program evaluation going on now by different people for different reasons and using different sources of evidence. And in the report, we have some, some tables that help sort through who's doing what, what sorts of information for what purposes these different systems are working. We had a number of principles that guided uh, our thinking about uh, teacher preparation program evaluation. Um, one of them is that you know, perhaps the most important question to ask about the system is, are the conclusions that you're drawing with the system valid? That is, do you have a good reason for believing in the truth of the conclusions that are being drawn? And to, to use the language of uh, consequential uh, validity that's, uh, that's alive these days, are the consequences that come from doing the evaluations the consequences that were desired in setting up the program? Another principle is that program evaluation itself is not sufficient for improvement. Uh, just doing evaluations of programs doesn't make them better. And if uh, the things that are revealed in evaluation um, require work or money, uh, something is, is, will be needed to be done to, to make improvements besides just saying, yes, this is good, or no, this isn't very good. Uh, there are multiple players with varying purposes and interests. I mentioned that before. In any program evaluation system, um, there are constraints of resources. There are only so many things that you can collect evidence on, and each of them exacts a cost on someone, either on the program itself or on the group doing the, the evaluation. And so, in deciding what to do, you have to weigh the limits and benefits of the different sources of evidence you're going to collect and the different things you're going to do with them. Uh, can, it's important in thinking about a, a, a preparation evaluation system to think about the differential effects that program evaluation will have on diverse populations. Just to give you one example, uh, in Michigan, where I live, uh, we have an area of Michigan called the Upper Peninsula, which is very sparsely populated, but they do have schools and they do need teachers. It's not easy to get people to go to the Upper Peninsula. Uh, and it's also a resource poor area of the country. So if you have a program that, uh, an evaluation program that says, well, the programs in the Upper Peninsula aren't doing the things that a Michigan State is doing, um, if the consequence is, is something bad for those programs, you're disadvantaging the, the community in the Upper Peninsula that needs teachers and is going to draw those teachers primarily from the programs in the region, because that's where they can get teachers. The, the solution is probably well, more resources to those programs to make them better, but just to point out that the system may have differential effects. Uh, we think the systems should be adaptable, you, there's not one solution for all times, and transparency for the system. People should know how the system works, and the systems themselves need to be held accountable. So just to give some examples of types of evidence, we, we have discussion in the report about a variety of different types of evidence. Uh, here are some of them. There are some that are input measures, selectivity, faculty qualifications, and so on, and some that are output measures. Over time, people go back and forth on the relative value of these things. Many systems have uh, some combination of these different kinds of measures. And all of these, there's some rationale for why these would be reasonable things to look at in evaluating the quality of teacher preparation programs. 
Uh, we, we talk a little bit about these, and we talk a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses of these different types of measures. So, for example, uh, input measures. Um, many of the input measures, uh, strength is that evidence is relatively easy to gather. If um, input measures do the faculty have doctoral degrees, that's an easy thing to count. Uh, many of these things have face validity, the input measures. People think faculty should be experts in the field that they're teaching. Uh, teachers should be studying learning theories. They should be studying methods of teaching. These are all you know, sort of seem, seem on the face of them to be good things to be looking at. Uh, but there are weaknesses to these inputs. Some of them, in, in general, is there's often little empirical evidence of connection to teacher quality at the end. Um, people like to think that the faculty should be experts, but there actually aren't many studies anywhere in higher education that connect the degree level of the faculty members to what their students actually learn. Uh, it's difficult to gather evidence on one important input measure, which is the quality of the things that are going on in classrooms and teacher preparation. And looking at input measures, um, and this isn't only a weakness of input measures, may produce superficial uh, compliance. So if the measure is you need to have courses with titles like theories of learning and school of society, it's easy to create courses with those titles, but it may not be that the uh, that, that there's much substance beyond those. Um, so output measures uh, also have different strengths and weaknesses. One of the strengths of output measures is that they focus on outcomes that people think they desire, the quality of teachers, whether or not that they got a job, whether their principals like them. Um, those seem like uh, uh, obviously important things. And these are things that are pretty familiar to key constituencies funders, citizens, and so on. Uh, weaknesses of output measures, many important output measures are difficult to measure. Um, just to, to take one, increasingly these days in education, people are pointing to the importance of non-cognitive outcomes of students in elementary and secondary school as being very important, and teachers' role in producing those outcomes as being very important. And we don't have a clue how to measure these things in schools in some systematic way and connect them back to teacher preparation. Um, another weakness in looking at outputs is it may ignore variation in institutional mission. Some programs are preparing teachers to be instructional leaders, and others think that they should be preparing teachers to be teachers of reading. They're quite different things they might be, be trying to accomplish. Uh, and a big problem in looking at outputs is it's challenging to account for the differences in incoming students. So the uh, a question, at least, is do you want to give an Ivy League school credit for graduating teachers who know a lot and probably knew a lot when they entered the institution uh, and, and give them credit for that when that's not something in terms of the elementary and secondary curriculum that they may have learned anything about in, during their years in school. They may have learned that before they got to school. Uh, that's, a, that's something that has to do with the incoming students, and do you want to, to, to give a poor rating to a school whose mission is to take students who um, are doing okay and turn them into terrific teachers, um, but who still may not you know, blow the top off the charts on uh, test scores. So just one more example of the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Value-added measures is a big topic these days. Uh, some of the strengths of this as an outcome measure is it's valued by policymakers and employers. They want to see that their um, the students, that their teachers that they're hiring are helping students learn. And, and the graduates of programs may be interested in whether the program is going to do something for them that may be a part of the evaluation system to which they're going to be a subject when they get a job. But there are weaknesses in this as a measure. It's confounded with school placements. Some of the studies are showing that what school you're in makes a difference in what these value-added measures uh, are like. And it may be that you want a teacher preparation program to be sending students to schools that aren't doing very well, even though this may make it more challenging for them to get to do well on the value-added measures. Also, these measures don't tell you much about what students learned while they're in the program. That's one important part of program quality. And this is an example where, in terms of uh, 
evaluation for program improvement knowing that the average value added score of your teachers isn't as good as that of your neighboring institution doesn't tell you what to do. It just tells you that there's a difference there. So uh, STEM, uh, it, there are some special challenges for evaluating STEM teacher preparation programs. Some of them have to do with uh, Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards, which are being rolled out and adopted. Um, we haven't figured out yet as an education community exactly how the teacher preparation programs should be revised in light of these new standards. I mean, what is it that teachers now need to study in order to be able to, to successfully teach the mathematical practices? Uh, there's a, and, and in part because of this rollout of new standards, there's a shortage of field placements where you have teachers that are already teaching these things from whom prospective teachers might learn. And in STEM in particular, uh, they, the people preparing to be STEM teachers often have career opportunities that other teachers don't. This may be a challenge for the STEM programs in terms of teacher retention because the teachers may be moving on. Uh, so how in the evaluation system should we take account of this? And finally, uh, this is the, the, the final chapter, gives some questions that we think that people designing or revising teacher preparation programs should be asking themselves as they think about teacher preparation program evaluation. Starting with, what are you trying to do? What's the purpose of this system? And then, uh, what if given that purpose, what are the aspects of teacher preparation that matter most? Because you can't gather evidence on everything, so you have to make some choices. What are the things that matter most given the purpose that you have? And then, so these are the things you'd like to know something about. What sort of evidence might give you information about, about that? Um, and given that there are strengths and weaknesses of every sort of evidence, how do you, how do you select those? And then once you've got all this evidence about different things, if you will need to come up with some overall judgment about the quality of the program, how do you put these different things together? Uh, next, uh, what are the, the consequences if you think about the system that you're designing? What are the things that, that your logic model for how this is going to lead to desired consequences? And what sorts of things should you be concerned about uh, that as we know about all sorts of systems that do evaluation, there are often unintended consequences that uh, where the, the people, the programs being evaluated will respond in ways that make them look better on the evaluation, uh, even though they're not really making a change in a desired direction. How will you make transparency? Uh, because transparency is, among other things, important for the programs themselves in order to if to use this, if they decide to, for guidance, uh, and to trust the results that they're seeing. And finally, how will the evaluation system itself be monitored so that it can be improved over time? Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, what's in here. There's lots more in here. I encourage you to read it. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Gene Burns, um, Associate Commissioner from the state of Louisiana. Thank you. My role on the steering committee was that from a policy perspective. Uh, within our state for the last 14 years, I've been on leave from my university, temporary leave for one year, but for 14 years. <laughs> and I have been very much involved at the state level with helping to create new policy for teacher licensure, for preparation approval, and for preparation evaluation. But my role has also been one of working with all of our chancellors, our chief academic officers, our deans, our faculty, and our K through 12 partners to be able to actually implement the new policies that were uh, put in place within our state. Our state is one where we have gone through a process of having more rigorous uh, teacher licensure standards. All of our universities had to redesign programs, both private and public universities. All of them underwent an external review by national experts. All of them uh, ended up having their pre-redesigned programs sunsetted, new programs implemented. Once they were approved, we had a teacher preparation accountability system in place until Hurricane Katrina. 
<laughs> All of our universities have had to be nationally accredited by uh, NKATE or TIAC. And in that whole time period, we also developed our value-added model and provided our campuses with drill-down data uh, that has helped them to look at where they have patterns for improvement. We've done all of that. We have spent a lot of time, uh, we've engaged individuals at a lot of different levels, and what I appreciate about the report that has come out is what you see within this report as far as looking at strengths and limitations reflect what I heard from our chancellors, from our deans, from our chief academic officers, from our faculty. The report does not tell you what to do, but it does provide information about what you need to be thinking about if you're going to be developing an evaluation system within your state. I think the greatest benefit of this report is that it is going to provide a foundation under which, or through which, um, individuals who are policy makers, K through 12 backgrounds, business backgrounds, they're going to be able to re uh, read the report and they're going to have a much better knowledge base on which to ask critical questions and on which to make decisions. Uh, we refer to the work that we've already done as Teacher Preparation Reform 1.0. We're getting ready to do Teacher Preparation Reform 2.0. Uh, the reason we're getting ready to do this is where we had needs in 1999-2000 when, when we identified our measures, where we had those needs, we've improved in those areas. Uh, we had very low praxis rates at some of our institutions at that time. We had high percentage of uncertified teachers. There was the perception that our new teachers were not satisfied with their programs. With our redesign programs, our campuses now require teachers to meet all state certification requirements to graduate in all institutions except one, and they have the pressure through performance funding to increase their numbers, so they have to increase the quality of their programs. Uh, we do not have the problem with lack of certified teachers, and what we have for data now pertaining to our perception is that schools are finding our new teachers, uh, not being concerned about our new teachers, it's the teachers who came out of our old programs that were weaker, where they now have the concerns. So as I said, we have new issues, new questions that we need to be answering now. We've looked at our value-added data. We know it's not the overall program. When we look at our drill-down data, it is specific content areas and specific grade spans where campuses need to focus their attention. Uh, this week, we've been, it's been announced that our state is one of seven states that will be receiving a grant from the Council of Chief State School Officers. They've recently issued a report uh, making recommendations for making uh, changes for teacher prep. Uh, they talk about evidence in it, but they don't talk about what you need to be thinking about when you look at the different types of evidence. When I go to the airport this afternoon, I'm going to be emailing the link to this report to everyone who's on our steering committee within our state who's going to be involved with the CCSO grant. Uh, we already have steering committee members who are wanting to jump to identifying assessments, new assessments, to look at our teacher prep programs, and we haven't had the conversation yet about the purpose of what we're doing, about what it is that we want to see within teacher preparation programs that's important to us, and we haven't even talked about what those core principles and beliefs are in our state we have no business selecting assessments until we've had those discussions. So I just want to end here by saying uh, that I think this report is very important. It needs to be put into the hands of uh, K through 12 um, policy makers within our state so that they can have a better understanding of uh, issues dealing with the evaluation of teacher preparation programs and if they have an opportunity to read this, and it's not just K through 12, but business partners and others who may be on steering committees within states making decisions about policies, legislators. But 
this will allow them, again, to have a common knowledge base on which they can ask critical questions and they can make informed decisions. So I'm looking forward to taking this back to my state, to our steering committee, and we're planning on using this within our state. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Ed Crow. Good morning. I appreciate the chance to uh, look at the report and to talk about it briefly this morning. And obviously, there's a lot of interest in this work from the size of the crowd. So to start with, this is the latest in, I guess, really a long series of reports and studies and commissions about teacher preparation and program outcomes and accountability. Um, and from my perspective, at least, I think it's fair to say that more time and energy have been expended uh, on commissions and reports than on making deep changes in teacher education or on improving program accountability. And so the need to do the work that Jean has talked about in Louisiana still exists in 49 other states at least. So there are things happening, obviously. CAPE is up and running, and we'll see over the next few years whether accreditation can make a dent uh, in program performance and in overall program quality. Certainly the will to move forward um, in a meaningful, data-driven way uh, is there for CAPE and its leaders. But of course, it wouldn't be the teacher education that we know without organized pushback against any commitment to quality. Prominent so-called leaders of the field now rail against using student achievement data as a program outcome. And maybe they, some of them, understand how devastating that information might be to the reputations of their programs. So to this report, uh, as Jean said, we're asked to think, among other things, about next steps that might build on the report and the work uh, that has gone into it. I think this is a moment in time when real change seems possible. Actions by the chief state school officers, as Jean mentioned, seven states moving ahead on teacher licensure, reform on rethinking program approval standards uh, in teacher education, the work of CAPE uh, over the last few years, new standards now moving <coughs> ahead, NCTQ's national reviews of teacher preparation programs, uh, pending federal rules now before OMB on program accountability, uh, building off of what started in 1998, seems like a long time ago, uh, the forthcoming report of an American Psychological Association Task Force on the use of data and measures for program improvement uh, and accountability, and uh, as of, I guess, yesterday, the rumored nomination of a new top higher education official in the U.S. Department of Education with a track record of important innovations in teacher education, maybe bringing a perspective to this that will command our attention. So for me, I think the next step that matters most is for policymakers and the profession to find the will to be serious about program quality and about accountability in teacher education. There's been plenty of talk about it in the last 20 years, but not much action. And for examples of will and commitment to change, all of us here today, those reading the report and others concerned about these issues, don't have to look very far. Louisiana, since 1998, has been on this sustained path that Jean has talked about, to stronger state policies, more vigorous accountability, the use of evidence about student learning as one measure of program quality. It's the only state so far where student learning is linked directly to program quality and program approval. Five of the race to the top states are building systems to do that, have made funding commitments to the Department of Education to do it, but none of them is doing it yet. And secondly, uh, nursing education, cited in the report with a paper about the development of uh, nursing accreditation uh, to come on the website. As this report does, I and others have cited nursing as a profession that takes its responsibilities to the public seriously, and over a long period of time has changed the way it does oversight of programs, licensure of graduates, and definitions of quality. They've implemented stronger accreditation policies, implemented licensure tests whose content and passing scores are the same in every state, something we should do in teacher education. Uh, the meaning of science and the quality of science teaching doesn't depend on the state you live in. 
So if teacher education wants to do something real, we should talk to Louisiana about their work, talk to deans of nursing, talk to the National League for Nursing, talk to the state boards of nursing in your own state that have taken steps to implement quality standards for programs and for graduates, and have done all this work as a profession across the country. A unified national approach to quality is really the best next step to the work that this, uh, that this report has discussed this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And finally, Mary Futrell. Good morning. The first thing I would like to do is to congratulate NAED for having the courage and the uh, commitment to put this report together. When you, I hope that everyone in this room will walk away today with a copy of it. And when you read it, I think you will understand why I am saying what I'm saying. Because it is one of the most comprehensive, most transparent reports I've ever seen that talks about the way teacher preparation programs are evaluated and the purpose of evaluation, what we should be doing for the future. I don't think it could be more timely than what we what receiving it now because of all the accountability efforts that we see underway in this country. And when I read the report, it is very thought provoking. It's not just a reaction. It is looking at how do we do a better job of preparing educators for the future. And I want to say to you that I agree with everything that Jeannie and that Ed said about the report, uh, and especially regarding the way it should be implemented. And I'm going to reverse the order in which I was going to speak and say to you that uh, I would suggest to NAED that it do everything possible to make sure that every single school of education in the United States of America receives a copy of this report. And that they not simply receive it, but I hope they will take the time to sit down and read it and to use it to guide the way they try to improve their programs. I hope that it goes to every state education agency. I hope it goes to the Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education, and all of the professional organizations involved in trying to improve the quality of education in this country, including the teachers unions, including CAPE, AACTE, et cetera. Because we all need to come together to work together in order to make sure that we are moving forward, not simply to improve the quality of the programs that we have, but how do we transform those programs so that we are being more effective, we are doing a better job of preparing educators for the future. And as I read through the report, and I would like to just comment very briefly on the seven questions, because the seven questions that uh, were mentioned by Bob and that are contained within the report are very thought provoking. They're not questions to which there are simple, quick answers. They're questions which will require people to sit down and really think deeply about how do we move forward and use these questions as a framework as to how we're going to design teacher preparation in the future. And I wanted to say that I would like to add an eighth question, but the report has been printed, so I can't add an eighth question, right? <laughs> but I can at least suggest an eighth question. But one of the things I thought about as I was looking through this, and I said to myself, how can or should we, especially colleges and universities, use the results of the evaluation for, to transform teacher preparation report to better prepare educators to educate citizens for our evolving global society. And looking at not simply fixing the problems that we have. You know, we evaluate, we get a report back, and the report says, these are your areas of weakness, these are the areas where maybe you fail, and you try to fix them. Not simply to fix, but to transform teacher preparation so that we are doing a much better job of preparing citizens for the 21st century. And I want to give you three examples of why I think that's very important. When we look across the United States of America, every single state now has at least one virtual high school. And we have more and more courses being taught online. So one of the first questions I asked myself as I was reading through this book, are the teachers prepared to teach in that kind of environment, that change in culture? Another example I wanted to share with you, are the teachers prepared to really deal with the diverse student population that we have? And when I think about that diverse population, I just read a report that came out a couple of weeks ago, and it really absolutely shocked me. They said that 45% of all the children attending public schools in this country live at or below the poverty line. And when you look at some of the groups, the numbers are absolutely staggering. Those children can learn 
Are the teachers prepared to really teach children from disadvantaged backgrounds? Are they really prepared to teach the children? And now student population is becoming more diverse. 40% of our students now are racially or ethnically, uh, from the racial or ethnic uh, backgrounds. Are they prepared to teach them? And the third statistic I'd like to share with you, in the report they talk about teacher retention. And they talk about the fact that 50% of all new teachers leave the profession by the time they've been in it in five years, within five years. But there's another statistic that's not mentioned in the report, and that's the fact that 50% of all current teachers will be retired at the end of this decade. That's 1.6 million teachers who will be leaving, and then you've got 50% who are not staying. So we may end up with an acute teacher shortage in America. So the plan, the program, where what we're proposing it, is not simply to fix the problems. Can we transform teacher preparation so that we're doing a much better job of preparing teachers to more effectively teach within this changing culture that we have? And we have to replace every single teacher because the enrollments are growing and we've got to make sure that every classroom is, is appropriately staffed. And so what I thought about as I read through the report, evaluation is not just about summative factors, it's also about formative factors. It's not just about the past and the present, it's about the future. So how do we reuse results of the evaluation process to transform teacher preparation programs and to transform the teaching profession? It's an opportunity we probably won't have again for another 100 years. And I hope we don't allow this opportunity to fade away without addressing those types of concerns. And again, I would like to congratulate and to thank NAED for this report. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Well, thank you uh, to the panel. Um, th these were wonderfully, glowingly positive reactions to the report. And I'd like to hear somebody say something critical. <laughs> Take us but, on. But they haven't read it. Well, they haven't read it. All the more, we can. Uh, um, but while we're, while we're, uh, yes, okay, good. Um, now, do we have microphones that are circulating? While we're doing that, I just want to say uh, uh, one more special thanks to um, the current president of the National Academy of Education, Susan Furman, who was here, who was on, actually came to most of the meetings of the steering committee and. Um, uh, among other things, uh, helped us think about the importance of laying down abiding sort of guiding principles as we were doing this report. And that helped me and the, the authors really get the framing on this. And of course, Susan has been masterful in her leadership of this organization, which of course gives me uh, tremors when I think of what comes next. But in any event, thank you, Susan, for wonderful participation. Uh, Jack Jennings, you're up. Uh, this indeed is a good report, and uh, it's a very intellectual, reasoned explanation of all these different factors involved in teacher evaluation. But for most of my life, I didn't live in an intellectual world. I lived in a very political, policy-oriented world. And what I find missing is a final chapter. And the final chapter would be uh, to say, uh, for the three different purposes you've identified, uh, accountability, consumer information, and improvement, that you would uh, recommend a system for each of those areas. Uh, you may want to recommend it with uh, explanations about what you would get and what you wouldn't get, but uh, it seems to me you have to close the loop. You have to actually come to a, con a conclusion instead of just uh, telling people here are all these different factors and here's what you should consider. So that would be the uh, only criticism I would raise about this. Uh, could you close the loop and help people do something instead of just trying to explain to people the pros and cons of different factors. You know, Jack, when you say that's the only criticism, I am <laughs> reminded of when I was in junior high in the school play, and one of the parents afterwards said, there's only two things wrong with that performance. The curtain went up and the seats faced the stage. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a totally legitimate criticism, Jack. Uh, and <clears throat> I, we, we struggled with this. I mean, to, to be serious about it, uh, given the amount of time we had and, uh, frankly, the resources that we wanted to use as effectively as we could, we thought that we would emphasize the framing, the 
the guiding principles and the issues associated with the design, the future design of evaluation systems. Uh, but I, I, I totally agree with the frustration effect here. And uh, perhaps we will be able to do the sequel. Uh, but I actually think the sequel should be written and should be done by people in the field based on their own ongoing uh, evidence and their own experience with this. But I welcome uh, policy people on the <laughs> panel to help me with this. I definitely want to respond to that because when I first became part of the steering committee, that's what I wanted. Uh, I really, and, and I kept I kept asking, you know, kept asking questions throughout the entire process because I wanted to have an answer that I could then take back to our state and I could say this is the best way to do it. Um, I actually have changed my mind <laughs> as we've gone through and as we've listened to all of the different national experts who came in and provided input. And as I thought more about our situation in our own state, uh, when I look across, and I'm asked to speak in a lot of other states as well, and as I look across different states in our country, different states are at different points in <coughs> what they are looking for to uh, look at effectiveness of teacher preparation programs. And I've come away with the understanding now that we should not be telling states and we should not be telling programs the best way to be doing things. What we need to do is we need to provide <coughs> them with information so that, as I said, they can ask those critical questions to determine what it is within their states that's important for uh, schools to have effective teachers and students to be learning and for whatever it is that they decide that they're going to use for evidence that it's linked. So I, I, I again, I guess I'm going to disagree uh, because in the beginning I thought there should be an answer for that last chapter. I'm now satisfied that there's a framework at the end of the chapter so that we as policymakers and states can take that and can start discussions within our states, educated discussions, and that we can be looking at what is the best evidence that we have uh, that could look at the effectiveness of our programs. So I think I don't think that even, I'm going to disagree with you, um, I don't even think that states should be saying in a report, this is the way to do it. I think that needs to be decisions that are made by individuals within states looking at what's important. And I know what we want is to have children across our country who are performing at levels to be competitive on a national, international level. And I think the Common Core State Standards, Smarter Balance Park, is going to help us to make those comparisons. But I think those decisions pertaining to looking at the effectiveness of the teacher preparation programs and the evidence, um, that needs to be a discussion within states. Does anybody else on the panel want to get in on this? Please, could you uh, stand and then shout out and identify yourself? <laughs> um, so we have a, a STEM teacher preparation effort at APLU. Uh, and so I, and we sort of see this as a campus-wide effort, <coughs> especially for secondary STEM teacher preparation. So I'm curious if the report discusses at all the responsibility of other colleges that really prepare, you know, have the content preparation for these teachers and how they would be involved in any kind of evaluation system. I, I would just say that the report acknowledges um, and makes the point that the preparation of teachers is not the sole responsibility of a college of education, at least at most places, that it's a, it's a joint responsibility of the variety of people that contribute to the education of teachers. And so when you're thinking about things like the quality of instruction, the quality of instruction isn't only the quality of instruction in the courses that start with TE or EED, but it's the ones that start with MTH or CHEM. Anybody else? Yes, uh, Sunny Ladd. Microphone coming. Um, 
I'm not going to make a criticism. Stand up. I, just, I, I got worried there for a minute because the criticism from Sonny is. No, go ahead. So now I just would like um, discussion from somebody on the panel or a couple of you about the relation, the similarities and differences with the nursing profession. I've just read the two pages in the document about that, and there are some interesting similarities and differences. So if you could talk about those, that would be great. I, I could say a, a word about it, but let me see if I can, can, is there a chance I could put you on the spot here, Jean? Okay, that, that let me, more appropriate. Jean and Christine wrote this paper about nursing, and Jean is a distinguished nursing educator, so it's wonderful that you're here, Jean, and help yourself to our microphone. Okay, um, actually some of the similarities um, have to do with, um, you know, both are primarily female professions, um, both have a fairly similar pay, salary, you know, sort of issue. In it, both struggle with, you know, sort of the recognition of what we do in terms of the value and importance and, you know, sometimes criticism. And um, I think that some of the differences, I, I mean, actually, there's a really important difference that struck Christine and myself as we were writing this that's, that's, that's very important. There is no way, uh, there, there has never been an attempt to link nursing student education to patient outcomes, <laughs> you know, um, and, and part of that reason is that, and, and the analogy is to student test scores and outcomes, you know, we measure it in days in the hospital and, and deaths and, you know, those kinds of things um, on toward events that happen in hospitals. But there are so many things that happen in terms of intervening. There are multiple health professionals that, you know, impact any given patient. You know, the system of care makes a difference. The leadership in that system makes a difference. And, you know, one of the, the things, while it seems like maybe a sensible or easy kind of thing to do is to link, you know, sort of test scores in a class to teacher preparation, you have some of the same issues. You've got leadership issues in different systems. Different systems are resourced differently. Um, you've got, you know, sometimes the setups where multiple teachers actually are involved in, in teaching, you know. And so I think that there are some, you know, um, certainly similarities in context and the complexity of the environment. Um, so, you know, that, that is the difference. We just don't try to do that. It's too complicated. Thank you, Jean. That's, I, I think that gets you to some of the, the subtleties here. Could, oh, Jean I, could, I, oh, could I add to that just a, yeah. for a second? I mean, another similarity is there are 1,200 schools of nursing as there are 1,400 university teacher ed programs, so it's a very decentralized you know, structure of professional education in all 50 states with individual state boards. What you have done, which we have not done in teacher education, is as a profession, take responsibility collectively for the quality of the programs. And so one of the pressures in teacher education to measure the impact of teachers is because programs will not stop people who shouldn't be teachers from becoming teachers. You have done that in nursing, and you've worked with your licensing boards. You have 50 of them doing the same thing in the same way. It's probably not perfect, but it's more than we're doing. Hmm. And I would say that one discussion that we had when we heard about the nursing profession stood out to me was that there is a standard, there are standard scores across states that individuals, uh, nurses have to obtain so it doesn't change from one state to another as far as what the expectations are for that knowledge base. Uh, for my uh Graduate students in the audience, I recommend a comparative study of nursing and teaching. Uh, <laughs> we've got some advisors here who'd be willing to work with you on that. Yes. Hi, my name is Donna Sacco. I um, am a PhD student at Mason, George Mason. I've been an we, we've adjunct. We've heard of that. That's just that over there. <laughs> Another George, but I've been an adjunct here in bilingual special ed. And I'm a nationally board certified teacher and I am on the board of the Council for Exceptional Children. So I bring to this, I am very interested that you mentioned our diverse populations, but what I see, and perhaps at first glance I'm missing something, but a gap in working with the culturally and linguistically diverse students and the students who are exceptional learners. 
And what I see, have seen as a teacher is that our new teachers are coming ill-equipped to handle students with exceptional needs. They do not have a toolkit for working on behavior management. And with teacher evaluation, what's happening is that more t students are being identified with exceptional needs because their behaviors are out of control. And teachers want them out of the classroom to have someone else handle them because they affect how this value added works with their um, teacher evaluation. So I ask that you address that issue for me. Thanks. So, so I mean, I think um, you, you raise an important issue. Um, I, I think that we don't, in the report, you know, single this out as something in particular. But uh, this falls under the category in the last chapter of of thinking about, you know, after the purpose of the evaluation thing. So, what are the most important things that you think should be a part of the teacher pre teacher preparation and um, you know, the place for those discussions about what you're trying to do is with the people developing the system to say, so, what is it we're trying, what, what is it that we want our teachers to be able to do? And, and, you know, you're laying on the table, here's a group of students for whom we should be doing a better job preparing teachers, and so the evaluation system, you would be arguing if you were in the room, should be sure to include evidence about the extent to, you know, things that are relevant to this, whether it's course content or it's things in the, in the examination system or it's things in the performance assessment or it's later on in value added that this would be taken into account there. I, I think what she's also saying is that there should be a blend between theoretical and practical and that it's not just looking at do you understand the theories behind who these diverse students are, but having practical experience as to how to really work with them. And part of the evaluation process should look at not simply checking off the box, but actually observing and, and evaluating how you actually perform in the classroom. I think that's the point she's making. And I'd like to just elaborate a little bit on that because we talk about the first step, um, first question deals with purpose. And when we went through teacher preparation reform 1.0, one of the areas that we identified as weaknesses was the area that you just talked about. And we started with licensure, where we developed integrated to merged special ed programs where a person came out dual, cer dual certified in regular education as well as in mild to moderate special ed. And we created those programs across our campuses within the state. We also have just regular education, but we have that as well. But we created that so that our, in, we have some institutions that have a growing number of candidates who are going into those programs. So we created the opportunity for that. And then through our value added analysis, as I indicated, we have drill down data. And we actually provide campuses with information pertaining to how well they're, pre they're preparing teachers who are certified in special ed but also we give them drill down data about how well special ed students did from all of their candidates to meet their targeted growth. Well, this, no, this is, these are all students, those who are, in, who are part of, who might be taught by a teacher who's in a regular classroom, but they have a classification as mild, moderate special ed they still get drill down data pertaining to how well they're preparing those teachers. So they can actually see if they have patterns where they have weaknesses in that area to go in and try to, to help. So again, it's when you're thinking about the evaluation and going back to the report, that's where when you start to talk about the evidence, you need to be talking about how do you want to use the evidence? And you need to make sure the evidence is going to allow you to be able to do that. I think I saw Martin Carnard's hand go up. Hi. <coughs> um, is this good? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not an expert in teacher preparation. And secondly, I've just skimmed the report in the last few minutes. So <laughs> Feel free to it. say whatever you'd like. That's right, but we don't have to listen. So I'm not going to say anything about the report. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. So. Uh, there, there's tremendous variation between states, I assume, in how teachers are prepared. 
and there's also tremendous variation between states on how well they're doing in teaching kids. So did you look at whether some states who seem to be doing particularly well and making particularly large gains uh, with kids over the last 20 years, whether their teacher preparation, uh, whether the relationship between them and the teacher preparation institutions is different than in states that don't seem to be doing so well and don't seem to be making much progress? We, we thought about that question, Martin. It's a, it's a terrific question. It is essentially, it's a variation on the theme of value added. Is there some way of estimating the added value of the ways in which teachers are prepared if you look at this comparatively with respect to some outcome measures? I, we, didn't, I didn't, we didn't have the data for that, and, um, and, but I think it's a, it's a totally worthwhile sort of question. Well, it's a different, uh, it, was a, it was probably a bad analogy to value added. It, but it, it, the suggestion is that in places that are doing teacher preparation differently than other places, is there some measurable effect on the quality of instruction in schools? Actually, that's the question the other way around. Yes. Yeah. In places where there seems to be doing very well, like Massachusetts, yeah. North Carolina, and Texas, are the teacher preparation No, it's, it, that's the right. That's the right question, and we didn't answer it. So, uh, so, so actually, I, there's a the last Bob, slide. There's the last slide that I didn't give, which, you know, which <laughs> in the interest of time. Well, it doesn't answer it. Um, but the last slide is, uh, and, you know, I hate to do this because, because you know how researchers do. The last, the last thing that says, well, what do we really need? More research, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, there are a, a variety of things that people, you know it would be good to do in order to improve the evaluation systems, which is the focus of this report, not, not that question in particular about the evaluation systems, like, um, you know, are there differential effects of teacher preparation on, what do we, you know, we need to know more about that, Dif impact of different evaluation systems on the preparation programs themselves, how to include non-cognitive outcomes, how to improve transparency. I mean, this is a, you know, the short list of things for which it would be good to do research that would be informative and help to improve the systems in the future. I would like to just add something. That's something I think we're going to be able to do much better in the future because of the fact that we're going to have the smarter balance assessments used in some states and park assessments used in other states. Um, I'm Another hat I wear is the lead for uh, higher ed for the park consortium within our state. And as we've had discussions pertaining to uh, different assessments used in different states, it's very difficult to even make comparisons across states because uh, what is considered to be mastery in one state is not mastery in another state. But once we have PARC and we have smarter balance, I think it's gonna be a prime <laughs> opportunity for us to be looking and, and since many of the states and not maybe all of them, but many of them are using Common Core state standards. Uh, it, we're going to be in a much better position to be doing research within the future and really look at practices within teacher preparation that we can look at across states and across different teacher preparation programs. So I think this is an area of research we need to be doing in the future. We still have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, Elizabeth Lodel. Um, I spent almost 40 years uh, in the trenches uh, and was principal of four schools in Fairfax County Public Schools of Virginia. And one of the things that I come to prize most in teacher preparation and teacher practice is the capacity and ability of people to think in a very interdisciplinary way. And for our universities 
to train everyone, and I don't think it's just the education people, to think out of their silos. Uh, young people with special needs come in every variety. Uh, at one moment, I was at Thomas Jefferson High School for science and technology, and the numbers of Asperger's and autistic kids uh, who came into a highly selective school uh, put amazing challenges on teachers. And I had teachers preparing other teachers who could go in and say, yes, this child needs to stand next to you while you teach. And if you're telling a physics teacher that, it's pretty interesting. Uh, to let people learn to figure out how to deal with it. But if we can enlarge our teacher preparation to help everyone understand that it is the sciences, of course this is about STEM education too, all of the sciences, it is the sciences understanding that music and the humanities and they have much in common with one another. And that you can teach young people at the undergraduate and graduate level to be far superior in their practice by getting preparation in this whole notion of how do you think interdisciplinary across the whole spectrum of and that's what we do as educators, hmm. just for your next report. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Laurie Shepard. Uh, Hold on, let me, this, uh, I want to make sure people can hear you. My comment uh, won't be as eloquent, uh, but I was going to follow up on something that uh, Martin said. I just, because uh, a lot of people here are, having your first experience thinking about uh, teacher evaluation, it's really important uh, to know how huge the heterogeneity is within state. Now maybe someone can tease out a main effect for policy. Uh, I will bet against it. Uh, and it's really important every time you hear a generalization to understand the vast heterogeneity if you line the programs up from best to worst in a state, uh, and that's not even counting the unofficial programs and all the pathways in, or there's no preparation whatsoever. Uh, and uh, the first data point in whatever uh, thing we do to look at state policies should uh, reference the recent Washington Post article pointing out that 20 years of data uh, in Tennessee that has had value-added assessment of teachers for that period uh, has shown uh, decrements in student learning, not increases in student learning. One data point. Tennessee, Tennessee has never used the value added data for program improvement or for program accountability. It's just a little sideshow that Bill Sanders and his group have done producing these reports that, but no one's ever used them because state policymakers haven't had the guts to do it and universities haven't been interested. By the way, speaking of uh, value added, um, I just want to put a plug in for um, a recent paper that was uh, written by our colleague Ed Hartle um, for ETS. It was the most recent Angoff lecture. And if you want to spend an hour uh, getting really, really lovely understanding of the plus minus of what we refer to as value added, I would commend Ed's paper really is a, a masterpiece. Uh, Lori. Yeah, just to, uh, I don't want Ed to leave with the impression that I'm against using value-added methods right. as one, <coughs> which is what you said, <coughs> as one indicator. And um, several years ago, the National Research Council, in partnership with the National Academy of Education, had a workshop report on value-added methods. And we, in fact, endorsed the use in aggregate uh, as opposed to for individual teachers. 
and I consider looking at teacher preparation programs and aggregate use of value-added methods and it's, um, uh, if it's used responsibly, um, I think it's a reasonable indicator. Yeah. Two more, David and then whoever that is at the rear table, you're gonna get the last question. I think this is uh, more a question about um, what happens next. Uh, at 9.14 this morning, I got an email from the National Academy of Education announcing uh, the release of uh, this report. At 8.14 a.m., I got an email from uh, a colleague, uh, uh, lobbyist for the International Reading Association, informing me that there's uh, you know, uh, the, the counter-narrative on teacher quality from NCTQ issued a report yesterday on um, you know, assessing uh, state uh, teacher evaluation systems around the country. A week ago, or maybe a week and a half ago, I got another email uh, indicating that the folks who wrote the NCTQ report uh, uh, you know, of a few months ago had uh, done a workshop at the uh, National Association of State Legislatures meeting, uh, Legislators meeting in Florida. So clearly, uh, whatever that counter-narrative is, it's getting out to the people who set state policy and are likely to make uh, uh, new set new regulations for uh, state uh, teacher, uh, uh, you know, evaluation systems and the <coughs> like. And I guess the question is, is where are we in that game, and uh, are we trying to make those same kinds of inroads to those to those policymakers who are going to uh, probably uh, set standards of consequence for teacher education in the next couple of years? Right. Well, there, there are some people in the room who are actually pleased to hear about the uh, <laughs> ever-widening dissemination of the NCTQ <laughs> model. Uh, but, you know, it, not to be glib about it, I, I'm actually grateful that we are able to have these kinds of public debates about this issue. I think, uh, in fact, even I have detected over the couple of years now since the NCTQ uh, project got started that there has been, um, first of all, that We've learned, I mean, I'm, uh, here in the academy, we, we were able to actually think uh, deeper thoughts about some of these issues because of the work of the NCTQ. They know that I and others have rather strong reservations about some of the methodological problems associated with that. And I think the, f the next step, David, is to continue this sort of uh, discussion, to be ready to come forward and say, <coughs> under certain circumstances, the kind of method that the NCTQ has been promoting may actually have value. Under other circumstances, it would not. And that was the whole point of this report, was to give people a sense of what are we going to make of all of these different uh, proposals and propositions. Uh, the business about you getting email at 8.14 and then another one at 9.14, I, have, I would bet that between 9.14 and 10.14, and until now it's almost 12.14, there are five other reports that are being prepared <laughs> talking about the plus minus of different approaches to doing this sort of thing. I, I don't know what else to tell you about that. The board of the academy always is involved in this question of what can we be doing to be even more nimble and timely and uh, and forceful, so I welcome anybody's thoughts about that. Well, you want to get just out? the other thing that, that we have talked about, you know, next steps for this report, one of them being going to meet with some groups, like people from the Council of Chief State School Officers. Um, and uh, I, I, I talked to one of the people that runs this, this project at CCSSO, just telling, saying this report is coming out. I mean, one of the things that we can do is engage with the things the, that that we have in this report about ways of looking at evaluation systems. And I would just add, um, yesterday again while I was in Indianapolis, I spoke with the person who's leading the CCSO initiative and um, talked to her about putting this into the hands of the other six states that are going to be part of this pilot and to actually start engaging in possible webinars or other types of things so that we could start to have discussions at a state level about how we can actually use this in ways in order to make informed decisions. And so I think what we need to be doing is working through different initiatives that are going on in the state. In fact, yesterday I, with this quarter college meeting, I talked about the report because there were people there, and that's another 12 states, uh, people there who were looking for this type of information. So I think it's really critical right now 
that we start to put this into the hands of policymakers and uh, others who are in positions of making decisions within states and nationally and that it become part of the discussions that we have. And it's going to take all of us to do that. But this is a time where we need to step up and we need to start talking about the fact that there are different ways in which you can examine evidence and that you need to be taking into consideration what's discussed within the report. I, I would like to build on what uh, uh, Gina just said and others, and I don't want to repeat what they're saying. I think in addition to uh, working with policymakers and different groups and sharing the word, I want to go back to the point that Jack Jennings made. I think it would be very, very helpful if NAED could come up with some exemplary examples of where teacher preparation programs are really working. And not just look internally within the United States, but look externally as well. As well. For example, look at what's going on in Scotland and look at what's going on in Finland and other places. Because people are going to need help. And this is a very theoretical document. It's very, uh, it's excellent. I have no problems with it. But what are some examples of what people are doing in order to try to, um, to transform the teacher preparation programs that we have? And I think that looking at some examples would be very, very helpful in doing that. And the second thing I want to add is, as we look at addressing the issue of the teacher shortages coming down the pipeline, I hope that one of the factors we will keep in mind is trying to make the teacher population more diverse. Thank you. I think I'm going to uh, renege on my offer to let you have the last question and just recommend that those of you who can hang around a little bit um, continue this conversation. Um, it's almost lunchtime and I know our fellows and our others have a, a full afternoon ahead and they're going to need a little bit of uh, uh, more than just intellectual nourishment at this point. <laughs> so on behalf of the Academy and the panel and the committee that did this and my guests here, I want to thank you all for participating in this.